Hi all, I am uh, delighted to join you uh, today to share with you Intuitive's perspective on surgery um, in the current age. Important to start where we are today with what's happening in the, in the era of COVID-19. As we've experienced uh, the pandemic, uh, we have access and interaction with customers all around the world, and, and we've seen this from the early part of the year in 2020. Uh, clearly, hospital response in step one has been to uh, align their resources, align their supply chains, make sure PPE is available, uh, ICU uh, resources are available, and staff are well-trained. In some cases, that's required postpone, postponement of elective surgery. Uh, we see that as uh, the, the intensity of the outbreak wanes a little bit uh, and more time is available, uh, institutions are able to be uh, bring back surgery and, and to do both COVID care and non-COVID care. Uh, taking you through how Intuitive has responded uh, in the face of this, how we've supported you. Uh, we started first by setting our priorities based on our values. Uh, our, our values are to serve our customers, serve our community, and serve our workforce. Uh, in the early days of the pandemic, we instituted uh, employee health and safety measures very quickly. Uh, we uh, brought our manufacturing lines down for about five days. And then using best practice from around the world, back th brought them back up. To the extent that uh, order volume was down, we switched our production to be able to do uh, PPE. Uh, so we manufactured so far over a million face shields and have donated those to communities in which we live and work. We've stabilized our workforce. Uh, we uh, have worked hard to, to build a great team uh, to support you and to, to support the company and the manufacturing organizations that we have. Uh, and so we've created um, uh, financial support for them um, uh, leave support and other kinds of training. In that sense, we've done really well. Uh, our supply chains have been solid and robust, uh, enabling us both to support you in your hospitals and support, a, support you from our factories. Um, we see the financial impact this is having on our customer base. We recognize in cases where you've had to defer, delay uh, uh, elective surgeries, we can provide some financial relief in the form of service relief or extended payment terms or warranty extensions and uh, we have done that. Uh, we've also launched our extended use instrument program. It's a program that has been in the works for many years, uh, extending the lives of some of our instruments. Uh, it's the result of an enormous amount of work in precision engineering and precision manufacturing. Um, we're happy to share it with you at this time. Uh, we think it helps in, in the face of COVID. And lastly, we're helping uh, customers address access needs. If systems need to be in a different place, if teams need to be trained, either using additional remote technologies or closer to home, uh, we've been able to pivot our resources and be agile in supporting you as we go. Uh, clearly, we're still in the early innings of, of COVID. It's hard to predict exactly how uh, it all resolves, uh, but we're here uh, working side by side with you uh, to make progress. We've seen the deferral of, of surgeries uh, called elective surgeries. Just in the case of da Vinci, robotic assisted surgery, uh, these are not cosmetic procedures. The vast majority of da Vinci procedures are done in which um, surgery is the primary mode of resolution of the disease. Um, so elective, uh, in this case, does not mean optional. I know you know that well. Um, and we've seen this before. We can uh, unfortunately predict what these deferrals will look like. Uh, for the urologists in the audience, going back to the period around 2012 when U.S. Preventative Services Task Force regraded the PSA test, we saw a decrease in testing that created a, a delay in diagnosis. And for a couple of years, uh, there were fewer diagnoses. And then uh, those diagnoses came back with more severe uh, cancer and more complex procedures. We know that that's true uh, for coli if, uh, cholecystectomies if they're delayed and inflamed gallbladder. We know that uh, complex hernias, if they're delayed, are likely to progress. Um, so this is creating a, a, uh, a backlog, and that backlog is a backlog of, of difficulty, difficulty for patients who have to wait and difficulty for surgeons. Um, I think it's in all of our interests uh, to find ways to uh, keep making progress concurrently and safely as COVID has progressed. You know, stepping back and looking at um, at least the oncology side here, we, we know that uh, the large number of diagnoses come from just a few uh, forms of cancer, the rest of, of cancer is making up the balance. We also know that uh, mortality, long-term survivability varies deeply. It's not highly correlated with the incident rate. And that's because of all the work 
that you do and all the work you've done over the years, um, we see that uh, these delays are not just surgery. We're also seeing delays in diagnostic pipelines. People are not going in for their diagnostic um, appointments, and that also is a cause for concern. We'll create uh, additional uh, burden on the health system and additional burdens on patients as we go forward. So working through both sides, how do we make sure that we can take care of patients who need procedures, but also how do we make sure that the diagnostic side has installed and people can get back into regular checkups and routine uh, work. Uh, looking forward, uh, what has been the role of surgery and, and long-term mortality? Uh, many of you are familiar with this data. Some of you are the drivers of the improvement. If you look at prostate cancer surgery or you look at prostate cancer survival, breast cancer survival, it, very large gains over the last decades, largely as a result of a lot of people on this call. Uh, there are other ones that are in the middle. Um, uh, improvements have been uh, hard fought and fairly slow. And there are a few lung cancer among them where uh, there's enormous room for improvement despite some progress. And, and I think we look at this together as, as opportunity. Uh, of course, uh, long-term outcomes are important. Often in academic circles, that's the one thing that gets talked about. But clearly, in the community setting and elsewhere, short-term outcomes and quality of life are really important. And certainly from a patient perspective, these things matter a lot. And there, we, we still have a uh, huge opportunity. And again, I'll share this data with you. Many of you know it. Uh, just starting with complication rates, uh, this isn't intuitive data. It's published national data. All comer patients, uh, this data on the left, in the United States, uh, with the entire surgeon population that treats them of all the surgical modalities, open lap uh, and, and robotic. And you can see um, there's huge opportunity. Uh, in complex ventral hernia, benign disease process, nearly one in five uh, patients have a complication. In rectal cancer surgery, complex surgery deep in the pelvis, uh, more than one in three still have a complication. Um, uh, not a lot of debate about this data. There, there are uh, many studies that show this, again, not intuitive studies. Look at uh, the other problem of this is variation or variability amongst care teams. And if you're a, a patient that sees a care team in the lowest quartile of skill, what you see in various studies, this is one for laparoscopic bari uh, bariatric surgery from New England Journal of Medicine. There are a handful of studies that are of this type. They're hard to run, but there's not a lot of debate that if you see somebody in the lowest quartile of, of skill, you're give or take two to three times as likely to have a complication, two to three times as likely to have a readmission. And this seems to be true or hold up for various types of complicated procedures. So on the left side, we know that short-term outcomes can definitely get better. On the, on the right side, we definitely know that uh, there's a lot of variability uh, amongst uh, care teams. And I think the challenge and the opportunity for all of us working together uh, collaboratively as a community is to do better, do better in long-term outcomes, do better in short-term uh, outcomes, complication rates, do better in variation, and do better in quality of life. So that comes back to the problem we are here to solve together. Uh, using your words, uh, the quadruple aim is developed by you, and, and we really guide the company according to this we are serious about it and we measure it. We, we want to make sure we have measurable progress. How do we help achieve significant improvement in the quadruple aim? Better outcomes, better patient experience, better care team experience, and lower total cost to treat per patient episode. And if you're looking at a company like ours, um, uh, computer-aided uh, surgery, uh, robotic-assisted surgery, advanced in event, interventions, it, it takes really th excellence in three categories. One is technical mastery, uh, robotics, but that's not enough, imaging, but that's not enough, uh, deep understanding of computing and capability and analytics, takes clinical mastery, really understanding the human side, clinical research, understanding uh, deeply skills, attainment, and competence, educational science, and we have a fantastic human factors team designed for inclusive environments, big patient populations, different surgeons, different care teams, and really understanding how it all works together. And then finally, operational mastery, understanding workflows, uh, doing time and motion studies, understanding the economics uh, of the total experience for the provider, for the surgeon, for the payer, and really understanding what it takes to drive these things into standards. So we've invested in these ways, and, and I think it takes excellence across. Many of you have seen this. Uh, this group, SRS, are really the drivers of this. Um, 
meaningful innovation that takes both technology and technique and workflow will change behavior. And this has been the, the progress of uh, da Vinci robotic assisted surgery globally over the last several years, kind of mapped or plotted by uh, region of the body. And this is international. Um, looking internationally, uh, I think it's fascinating. You, you see, uh, just taking urology to start, prostatectomy adoption by country around the world. And I've just highlighted a few. We know, for example, uh, deep penetration in the United States. You may not know, um, NHS uh, England, uh, high adoption of, of DVP in a, in a kind of benchmark single payer system. Uh, Germany, uh, high adoption of DVP in a federated uh, payment system. Uh, in Korea, kind of a hybrid, hybrid public-private uh, healthcare system, high adoption. In Japan, uh, mostly a single-payer system with little private insurance. Um, and if you go forward and look at, well, okay, DVP, what about another procedure, partial nephrectomy? It is likewise adopting. So you, you see uh, all of you uh, around the world are, are making robotic-assisted surgery work in these different health systems. It isn't somehow tied to a particular way that a health system is structured. There's some core value here. And we're seeing growth beyond urology. So um, it's exciting to be a part of it. Uh, just kind of zooming out, we're gonna talk for a minute about where Intuitive is. Uh, some of the things we're working on are uh, uh, well established in the marketplace and some things are brand new and really at the leading edge of innovation. And so I would just wanna remind everybody, many of you have seen this, Adoption is driven by a significant change to patient and surgeon value, expressed in the language of uh, patient and surgeon uh, priority, what they really need as practiced in their environment. And uh, so you can look back at how new technologies and techniques kind of characteristically adopt in the marketplace. This has been well known, many of you know this well. Um, we know in the very beginning uh, that new ideas, new platform, new techniques, come in and, and they offer the promise of some advantage in some dimensions, but they may be uh, inferior to existing technique or awkward in others. Uh, early adopters and innovators work out the kinks uh, back and forth iteratively with companies and, and come up with ideas that start to demonstrate real value, that, that really create a different change. Uh, there's a point at which uh, the broader community recognizes that change and it starts to adopt more broadly. And finally, uh, once it's broadly adopted, its value is now obvious to the community, and uh, it's, it feels like it's something that should always have been there. And, and I set this up uh, just to talk about what it's going to look like in the next few years as new ideas come to market. Of course, in our world, technology helps power the change, but it's not enough. It really is technology plus a deep understanding of people and the way in which the work gets done that makes change. Um, just taking you through how we think about it and how we invest. First, we, we design for a broad uh, patient population from the fifth percentile adult to the 95th percentile adult uh, of all sorts. And so you, your designs, uh, it's not enough to be uh, capable at the average. You have to be capable across the whole range. We also design for uh, diverse care teams and diverse environments. Uh, not all ours, ORs are the same, not all surgeons are the same, not all nurses are the same. And so we have a population of that set of people too. And finally, in the last few years, we've really come to understand you have to sew it all together for the programmatic aspects as well. Uh, what is the set of data that needs to be uh, generated for the program to be run efficiently, for the work workflows to be really well understood, and in a way that fits in the healthcare system as well, whether the healthcare system is NHS England or the healthcare system is a private hospital in, in Texas, they need to see data that helps them understand it. And so it's really this holistic approach that gets interesting. And one of the things to think about when you think about how much human interaction is required is Ask yourself, how many people are required, how many humans are required to do the right thing the day of surgery? And we ask you, we ask uh, folks who study that in your population, how many people have to do the right thing for that patient to come home and get a great outcome? And the answer from you is somewhere between 50 and 75 people are engaged in the back and forth. And so what that means is really understanding the human element really recognizing that technology can be a facilitator, 
but in and of itself cannot be the whole answer. And that's what we're really trying to describe here. And it's a set of perspectives that we try to bring. This is our system uh, platform. I, I love this picture because it's just really straightforward uh, what we're trying to achieve. Uh, we have a well-designed and thoughtful surgeon's environment. And we, we have a set of products, in, starting with multiport, that enables very high quality, minimally invasive surgery in a multi-port format. There are some amongst you that are interested in, and we agree, exploring what uh, fewer incisions into the body or entry through natural orifices can do in terms of advancing patient care and uh, changing outcomes. And so we have our single port system, SP. It's kind of at generation 1.5. And there are other opportunities that we think uh, don't require incisions. Our, uh, entering the body and doing work through natural orifices completely. And that's our ion system on the left. So we really go multi-port, single port, no port. Uh, we're a believer that there's going to be value to be created for patients and for the healthcare system at each of these points. And it's a pretty simple set of concepts, pretty simple hypothesis to pursue. I love this perspective. So we've talked a little bit about some technologies that are mature, uh, multi-port systems, have been uh, on the market for the last 20 years. First uh, FDA clearance was in 2000. First CE mark was in 1999. But uh, a robot system is not enough, and, and I think you've now all seen this. Uh, you need the system. You need the right instruments and accessories. We need the right regulatory clearances uh, around the globe. You need to have your training systems in place. Genesis is our, our uh, workflow optimization program. Uh, clinical evidence generation and resources, uh, the, the teams to support you, sales teams and support organizations, the ability to understand the messaging to patient populations and to surgeons, academic medicine, understanding and working with standards committees, uh, training and clinical publications, and finally, economic validation. And the point of this slide is that this kind of build out of the ecosystem to really be an effective program happens system by system procedure by procedure, country by country. So developing it out really takes time and excellence and resources. And to do it well is what's required to really uh, move from an interesting early experience to a, a well-adopted uh, standardized experience. So where are we now? I think that we're progressing. If, if you think about from the early days of the adoption of a Da Vinci system, multi-port robotic-assisted surgery, in the beginning, people... Um, start to deploy this clinically and look for where does it create real value. Over time, they start finding value. You all start finding value and you start to operationalize it, get into rhythms, get into standards. And then over time thereafter, particularly with uh, the, the addition of data uh, analytics, you can start to see where there are opportunities to standardize. And what I'm sharing with you here is some data from the last few years on hospitals in the United States that own five or more Da Vinci systems within the four walls of a single hospital. So this isn't uh, a large institution with 10 hospitals owning 10. It's, it's an institution that has put five of them in their set of OR suites in a single building. And that number has grown 400, 450% over the last three years. So it's really striking to us. And, and you might ask why, what's driving that? And I think this is really what the main driver has been. Uh, the ecosystem enablement that has allowed this. On the left side, uh, we see the, the typical publication database. There are now well over 21,000 peer-reviewed journal articles written about Da Vinci systems by all of you and your peers. And I think we know that a single publication uh, rarely changes practice broadly. And, and there are reasons for that. Uh, we know that prospective randomized clinical trials are rarely run in uh, surgery. They're hard to do. They're hard to accrue. Um, we, we know that uh, uh, they tend to be smaller trials. They tend to be academically based star versus star, star surgeon versus star surgeon trials. And as a result, we find that they're A, rare, and B, not particularly predictive of what happens in the community. And as a result, you all, while you read them, don't typically change practice quickly when you see that. But something new has happened, and that has been the investment of your institutions in electronic health records over the last five to 10 years. And while those uh, EHRs can be frustrating and imperfect, they are allowing new real-world evidence data sets 
for you to analyze your own uh, environment. It's really your own data, the truth in your institution. And we have collaborated with you <clears throat> in over 270 different hospitals and over 600 different runs. It means that several hospitals, several of you have called us back and said, let's do it again. And what this allows you to do is look at your own patient population, your own surgeon population, and the own, your own variance of practice with your data sets between lab, open, and robotics. And that data access is what's allowing, I, I think, administrators, chief of surgeries, and surgeons to get alignment around where's the real value here, what should we do to make better progress, and take actionable steps. I, I think it's extremely exciting. It's kind of a, a step change. Um, what does that look like in your environment, kind of your data, your analysis, your truth? Um, the very first thing is start with kind of a simple cut. This is a, an example hospital. It's not uh, the biggest volume robotic center. Uh, it's not the lowest. It's somewhere in the middle. And, you know, the first thing is you look through and you say, well, what really are uh, my different practice patterns between lap open and robotics? Uh, almost all inst uh, institutions have all three. Uh, often folks don't really know what their own splits are. Individual surgeons might, but the institution itself doesn't. So just starting there is interesting, and of course you can trend that in time. And then you can go forward and start looking at uh, clinical outcomes that you're interested in. What's ICU um, participation by surgery type? Uh, here you see that robotics is lowest in this particular example for, for uh, cancer colorectal procedures. Uh, what are conversions to open surgery? What are length of stay? Uh, those kinds of clinical measures you can analyze pretty carefully. Again, you can trend in time. And then also you can look at variation in your surgeon population. Um, it might be uh, here uh, use of enhanced recovery protocols. It can be time in OR. Uh, you can look for opportunities for cross-sharing between surgeons and between modalities. What's working in robotics? What's working in open surgery? What's working in lab? And establish be best practice. In the case of this institution, they looked at best practice across all three modalities and were able to find a savings of 400 bed day uh, stays by doing some standardization. It's kind of neat. It isn't rocket science. It's actually kind of a logical step through the analysis. It's kind of big data, not AI, but it's powerful. It's a powerful set of steps, and I think this is powering change. Um, the offline analytics are powerful, but of course they're not the only thing. You, you, you need to make progress. We together need to make progress at the tissue level, at the outcomes level. And that takes the right tools, the right technologies, the right understanding of human beings and workflows and training. Get that right and it powers progress. Um, where are we? So back to that kind of adoption curve. If you look at where our product sets are, our platforms, we have um, our multi-port systems, Gen 4, really in the majority uh, part of adoption. There are over 90 different clinical indications around the world for its use. Uh, it's quite a complete ecosystem. I'll take you into a little more detail at some of the uh, surrounding ecosystem products that are coming. And on the left side, you see SP uh, just coming up through innovators and early adopters, um, getting pretty exciting there. And then ION just, just starting. Uh, turning to Multiport XI, uh, we've really been investing in uh, bringing next generation imaging, next generation instruments, better analytical tools, and really completing our ecosystem. And so many of you have seen this. Um, Firefly and molecular contrast agents to allow for better visualization in surgery. I think that helps drive outcomes. Um, the use of preoperative images in segmented 3D models, I'll show you a video in a minute about that. Um, additional advanced instrumentation, um, stapling, vessel sealing, uh, that are fully optimized for use in a robotic platform. So I think really powerful set of technologies that have come. Okay, so you know, let's turn to uh, SP. Uh, SP is, is really uh, in its first phases here. It's with innovators and early adopters. Um, we're, we're starting to expand our clinical indications. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, we're uh, with you optimizing technique and optimizing the technology itself. Uh, evidence is in development, that'll be exciting, and, and we're starting to enhance its ecosystem from additional instruments to uh, analytic tools to uh, um, uh, simulation and so on. Uh, what's interesting here in this phase is that 
Uh, this is a, a phase with a lot of back and forth, a lot of argumentation uh, amongst the clinical community. I understand that. And that is, there are folks who see value who are looking to develop that value. There are other folks who are saying, hey, we don't see the evidence yet. And that's true. It's, it's early. The evidence is in development and it's coming. Um, but I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised to see some debate here. It's to be expected. And, uh, you know, I'll share with you where we think it is. Uh, just turning to... Um, uh, use in urology. Several of you uh, in this society are uh, using SP and comparing it. Um, uh, you see here Dr. Patel, uh, his, uh, our, uh, the, the world's highest volume uh, da Vinci prostatectomy surgeon in multiport, uh, testing or using or developing SP in single port. And that's a high bar uh, to match, uh, to, to go uh, head to head with a brand new platform against a uh, a fourth generation platform in the hands of somebody who is, who is expert. And so I'm excited to see it. And here, uh, PAR, equivalence in the very first step is a very positive step because it shows you the, the stability and the raw capability of the platform. Um, we, we'll see where it takes us and, and I'm excited to see that. Uh, turning to uh, natural orifice surgery, this is a transoral robotic surgery uh, application. And a couple of videos here by by surgeons doing a base of tongue resection. Um, I think both of uh, these surgeons had prior experience in multi-port on SI and are using it, uh, using SP now. And what we see is that there's a period of adaptation. The, the tools have different trade-offs uh, and they have different strengths. And over time, just in conversation with folks in this space, you can start to see you can optimize the procedure for the unique capabilities of a, of a product line like this. Um, in the United States, we have clearances in urology and transoral robotic surgery. Um, in, in Korea, the regulatory uh, framework is a little bit different, and our, uh, our partners in Korea have broader indications. So uh, there we can look to where else might uh, use of SP go as uh, Korean surgeons innovate. Today, they're using it in over 20 different types of procedures. Uh, the average number of procedures per year being performed on an SP in Korea is over 300. Over 300 is actually higher utilization on average than the average XI system is in, uh, in Korea. And that gives us some real um, enthusiasm because it says that there are real opportunities here for differentiated clinical value. Not every procedure done on SP is uh, necessarily differentiated than a procedure done on XI. XI will will uh, bring great value to many, many procedures that SP may not. But SP may open new opportunities or bring additional value uh, to procedures currently being done by XI. And I, I know from conversations with all of you that those are the debates. That's what's going back and forth. And I think that's healthy innovation um, for the community and for the company. Turning for a moment to our uh, flexible endoscopy uh, platform, ION, originally first targeted at bronchoscopy. Uh, really exciting. So this is first application is going uh, transorally, transbronchially into the lung to help identify and biopsy uh, suspicious lesions in the in the peripheral parts of the lung. Uh, again, we start off with uh, a set of technologies along with the beginning part of our ecosystem and are developing that ecosystem out. Uh, evidence is in development. Early results and returns from those of you who are running those studies is quite encouraging. Uh, technique is being optimized, as is the technology. And uh, over time, this will be a platform technology. It will give us additional opportunities to uh, navigate tortuous pathways, perhaps deliver therapy in other parts of the body. For where we are today, uh, Intuitive is tightly focused on uh, the lung. We think that there's real opportunity here in lung cancer. We know that early diagnosis is important. We have a video here from uh, Dr. Semoff uh, doing a, a, a ion case. And what you see at the beginning of the video is the initial orientation inside the body. It's registering a preoperative uh, segmented model of the lung, a CT scan segmented of the lung, registering it to the actual lung. And then you'll see um, the progression side by side of the actual endos endoscopic view along with the preoperative model of the lung. And that registration allows for guidance um, uh, they'll navigate the torture of the pathways down to the lung to, to take a biopsy itself. 
Uh, we're seeing the different trials that are coming through. Uh, so far, so good. Um, feedback has been strong. Uh, uh, product innovation and product refinement is coming along really nicely, and uh, we're quite encouraged. Turning to a related thing, you think here about, we were talking about preoperative CT scans. Um, uh, in many cases, in many cancer cases, you have a CT scan already available in your PAC system. You have already done it, but it sort of sits there and it isn't easy to access uh, inside the case. And our IRIS program, this is a video uh, provided by Dr. Steifelman uh, at his AUA presentation in, uh, in the case of a nephrectomy. And you, you, wouldn't it be nice if you had a segmented uh, picture uh, anatomically correct of that CT scan available easily within your console that's easily manipulated so that you can refer to it during the case. And that's what Dr. Stifelman is showing here. Um, is, it, is it hugely value creation creating in every single case? Maybe and maybe not. But for a difficult anatomy, it's quite clear that it can increase confidence and in tissue identification during the case and this is the kind of thing that will get better sequence after sequence, uh, model after model. Uh, it's based on cloud computing. It uses CT scans that are, that are required in any case for surgical procedures. And it starts to add to our cloud capabilities, our Internet of Things. And, and I'll take you through that. Uh, one more thing that we can bring um, is really uh, machine learning and cloud computing as it relates to surgeon skill assessment. Um, we, we know that during early learning cases of surgeons, uh, it's helpful to go back and look at reference uh, cases, reference technique, and we can now use uh, video analysis, machine vision, and AI to start connecting variants in a particular case, a real case that's being recorded, with a standard, with a gold standard. And so we're working with several of you to essentially establish that set of guidance and the algorithms that are in place to develop a, a tool that allows a learning surgeon to check their performance in a graded way and with high-speed video uh, scanning, video service, to look at where are they deviating from standard technique and what might they do differently. Uh, this is our uh, program, it's called Super, uh, not available widely yet, but it's going through our development process and, and we're really excited about it. Turning to our, our cloud methodology, um, we have been the Internet of Things now in surgical robots for a decade. Uh, a little bit more than 90% of DaVinci systems globally are, are hooked up to the cloud in real time. And that has given us uh, an ability to support you better and a way to generate a lot of insight. Uh, for example, 30% of uh, service calls are resolved uh, purely over the Internet by our staff being able to see the state of the system and su provide suggestions uh, to the team in, in real time rather than re requiring a system to be shut down or waiting for a part. Um, on the educational front, uh, we've invested in simulation. We're on our fourth generation of surgical simulation. Uh, these are networked simulators now. And uh, this last rolling 12 months, uh, you all, surgeons, logged 27,000 hours of simulation time across uh, 310,000 different uh, rot runs, trials, and a, and a surgeon population in the online a community of over 9,000 surgeons. And you can see that uh, we're developing not only uh, procedure-based simulation, our teams are experimenting with gamification of simulation to uh, help residents acquire skills more quickly. Uh, we're spreading our simulation capabilities to new platforms like SP, like ION. And um, I think this has a powerful effect, not only uh, to help surgeons practice, but also to collect data on surgeon skill acquisition to competence and uh, population-based data. So here we can help do our part with you on reducing the surgical variation, care team variation we were talking about. Uh, lastly, we've invested over the last several years with a partner, InTouch Health, in telepresence. And uh, that's turned out to be uh, a helpful and effective thing in the time of COVID. Um, telepresence enables remote proctoring, so uh, proctors don't have to get on planes to help, and it enables remote uh, case observation. Uh, we've just seen the last couple of months that uh, the uh, number of telepresence sites has tripled uh, since uh, COVID has happened, uh, and it's something that, that uh, can be replicated uh, reasonably quickly in the age of uh, digital technologies. So this has been helpful, and I think it will help all of us together. Lastly, as we come to a close, 
uh, it's not hard to imagine stitching these capabilities and technologies together for an episode of care. And so here's how we're thinking about, for example, lung cancer diagnosis and treatment. Uh, we can partner with, and we have uh, partnered with those, with those institutions that are on the imaging side or the cell analysis side or the machine vision radiomics side around uh, gathering images. Uh, we can participate uh, sometimes directly, sometimes with partners in the collection and diagnosis of uh, biopsies. And then, of course, that moves to treatment. We have an ablation program ongoing. Um, there are uh, other downstream uh, minimally invasive options uh, should somebody come up with a positive uh, biopsy from radiation therapy to, um, to a da Vinci surgery. So stitching together the episode of care, either directly or with, with partners, is important. And we're happy to partner with those who can bring uh, value and, and make the workflow uh, and the patient and surgeon experience better. And it's been, I, I think, really positive and exciting. Uh, so, so closing up here, um, uh, I think the, the quadruple aim has always been important and will become more so in the future, not less so. I think uh, the pressure on our healthcare systems will increase as we move through COVID, uh, getting good outcomes measurably so that have patients recover quickly and re recover at home when they can clearly is a positive. The change to cloud-based analytics and routine use of um, uh, local analytics, your data, your truth, I think is powerful and transformative. And lastly, the beginnings of investment in and the realization in the field of uh, cloud computing, real-time aids, and um, real-time learning capabilities are, are fantastic and I think are going to power change. Finally, my last uh, slide is... As you think about what to expect from Intuitive, here's how we seek to support you. We want to be entrepreneurial. I think we are. It means having a vision for the future that makes sense and is, and is aligned with your need, uh, is bold when it comes to uh, innovation that can really make a difference, and has rapid cycles of learning. And you're seeing that from us in ION, in uh, cloud computing, in our, in our modeling, in IRIS. Um, these are complex technologies. You will have choices amongst many suppliers. Um, it requires demonstrated competence uh, from the ability to deliver on commitments to the quality of the product to technology mastery. And finally, grounding in what it really means uh, to deliver a different outcome and what it takes to learn and, and move to competence and how innovation progresses in a clinical environment and what the clinical environment requires of the ecosystem. Um, I'm delighted to spend time with you. It's an honor to serve this community, and I look forward to seeing you again in the future.